Hi, everyone. We... Okay. We're going to do a quick Q&A. So hold on. While we check everything. So what we've committed to do is doing Q&As every two weeks live on YouTube and on Facebook in my group. So we have a photographer's group with about 31,000 photographers from around the world. And because we have an international audience, we know some people are sleeping, some people are awake, some people are, it's dinner time, other people it's lunch time. I receive questions every day from around the world. Today I'm just going to read a few of the questions that I received and try to answer them the best that I can. In 2021, we are going to try to do Q&A every other week for the year, but we are going to try to keep it brief, about 20, 30 minutes. Hopefully, I can keep it that long so that uh, by keeping it brief, we can answer just some of the quick questions that come in and hopefully help you along in your journey. Understand that it is important to get help. Many times we just reach out on Facebook and we post questions that are really going to affect our business. I highly suggest you seek training or mentoring. I actually just finished a clinic this morning here in my Tustin studio, and I do teach. I've taught for going on almost 12 years now. And I also do provide mentoring programs. This week alone, I conducted three Skype mentoring sessions, just one-on-one -on -one talking on Skype around the world. When I do my Skype sessions, I'm just talking to someone like you who has questions, who maybe needs help with pricing or light placement or marketing. And sometimes you just need that one-to-one -one connection and follow-up. You can find all about my mentoring programs at workshops.annabrandt.com. You can use the code this weekend, MentorMe, which will give you 30% off for this weekend purchasing any of my in-person or Skype mentoring programs. After this weekend, my mentoring program will close for a little bit uh, because I do end up getting quite a few mentorees that I need to take time to mentor. So I can't keep the program up all the time, but for those of you that I've mentored, I know for a fact it's made a difference because I can see the work that you're doing. And sometimes we need more than just a Facebook group or more than a quick Q&A to guide us along in our business, especially now more than ever. So Alex is gonna put the questions on the screen and I will do my best to answer them. If you have a question, feel free to post it and I will see if we have enough time to answer your question as well. This first question is kind of long. My lease is up and I am rebranding my business as a full service luxury private or portrait studio. How important is the location of my studio to potential clients? And let me read the rest real quick. Can they hear you asking the question? Okay. And if you had school age children, would you choose a location close to home for convenience? Or do you recommend selecting a studio based on what is most convenient to clients? Certainly uh, centrally located in the city near upscale neighborhoods and just deal with the commute 30 minutes plus uh, hour depending on traffic. Okay, so I'm gonna answer the second question first, which is if I have school age children, would I keep a close uh, to their geographical location or um, travel. Well, here's the thing. If you know anything about me, my life, my entire world for the past 20 years has all been mm, within a 10 to 15 mile radius. When my kids were little, little, my life was about a five mile radius, literally. So I had my home and then the preschool, Evans Preschool was two miles that way. My studio was two miles that way. So literally it was four to five miles and my whole world for years was that way. I actually enrolled my daughters in a preschool a block away. So I'll, I'll back up a little bit because it, it's hard for me to answer because it depends where you are. For me, we had a home in Tustin Ranch. And so Tustin Ranch is more of a bedroom community. 
And then you have Tustin, and you kind of have Old Town Tustin, which is this, Old Town Tustin is like three blocks this way, three blocks that way. It's teeny, teeny, it's this little plus sign in the middle. It's tiny, tiny, tiny. You have Santa Ana on one side, you have Tustin and Irvine, you have highways that go every which way but Sunday. So when we bought a house, I was working out of my garage. And so that was nice because I had a little baby and I just had, I already had Evan. So I had two kids under two. So I couldn't really go anywhere. When I got my first studio, actually, let me back up. Yes, we got the home. Well, when I got my first studio, I was pregnant with Olivia. So yeah, we had two kids under two. So my first studio, this 500 square foot studio that I talk about all the time, was only two miles away from my home. So for me, at the time, my husband traveled all the time. And so it was pretty much just me with the children. So I didn't have that luxury of getting on the highway 30 minutes. I wouldn't even say luxury. I wouldn't say that's a luxury. It was just was not optimal for me personally to get on the highway anywhere. Because if you know anything about California highways, gosh, you get on it and all of a sudden you're in LA. I mean, it's just, I was coming from New York, so I didn't understand California highways. And they completely freaked me out. So for me, being in a new area, a new part of the world, I was not comfortable commuting far. So when I was looking for a studio, I was like, well, I'm just not gonna go far. It has to be within a couple miles, has to be affordable, and I have to be able to get Evan to preschool and get back to the studio. And Olivia I hadn't known yet because I was pregnant and then I had her and I was just gonna take her to work every day. And so I just wanted to keep everything close. Then my studio blossomed and in a year I moved to the center of Old Town Tustin where I've been ever since. So within one year, I went from a 500 square foot studio of $500 to a 2,500 square foot studio of $2,500 and became a six figure photographer within one year and then got pregnant again. My girls are 23 months apart. So when I was choosing to upgrade my studio simply because I was out of space and I was having a third child, there was no way I was gonna, I couldn't go anywhere. Evan's preschool was still two miles away and so I was like, well, I'm gonna, when Olivia's time to go to preschool, I will find a preschool close by. So their preschool is literally a block away. It was actually shut down after COVID and I get very sad every time I drive by it. And I'll never forget that I went there and they were, they had a year and a half waiting list. So that's the downside. Here, you kind of have to get your preschool like when you're pregnant. So they had a year and a half waiting list and I was like, I don't, I don't have a year and a half. I think I don't have a year and a half. And I remember, I don't know if it was the director at the time or the teacher or somebody, whoever was there, I was like, I'm a photographer, I'll do whatever I can do to get my daughter in this preschool because I'm pregnant with another. And she said, well, I need a wedding photographer and I don't do weddings. I had, at the time, I think I had done five weddings. I've, I've done seven total, but I was like, well, I'll shoot your wedding. She's like, well, it's a second wedding. It's a backyard wedding. It's super, super simple. And I was like, okay, it's probably like a family photo session. So I did her wedding in exchange for getting Olivia in that preschool. True story. And it was filmed at the time. So I got her in that preschool and then Ava eventually a couple of years later went into that second preschool. And then they kind of stayed with each other and their schools were always, the farthest school they went to, well, Evan ended up going to Orange County High School of the Arts, OSHA, and then they, now Ava's in Olu. Um, so these schools are in Santa Ana and Orange. And if you know the map, it's like Tustin, Irvine, Santa Ana, Orange. So everything is like super close. I think the longest we've driven is 20 minutes for school. And that's a stretch. So. I needed my world close to me. I'm very close with my children. Just today we were joking in the clinic. I think my son called me like five times. Olivia texted like four times. I've already talked to Ava. We're super close. We've always been close. And my intention to have children was to stay close to them. And we've developed a really good relationship along the years. And I have teenagers now, and to me, they're the best teenagers on the planet because I was able to build the business, including them in it, which that's literally a whole other top topic. And I will be doing a, pod a podcast on creative parenting. We're going to be stripping our podcast channel next week. I am on iTunes. Uh, but next week, I'm taking down all my previous podcasts and 
creating all new podcasts for 2021. We'll be releasing podcasts every Monday for the year. So next week, I'm going to record a month's worth of podcasts at a time, so it's easier to release. But one of the topics is raising creative children. You know, it's up to you and where you are. I don't know where you live. So I'm when I'm mentoring photographers, they're like, well, I'm in a teeny tiny town. There's like one post office. It doesn't make sense for me to get a studio here. No one's going to come here. I need to go a half an hour to 40 minutes away. And then you need to, if you have a partner or a husband or a wife or whatever, you need to sit down and have that conversation and say, can I do that? I know many instances where the partner's at home and they say, yeah, you can do that. You can drive a half an hour or 40 minutes away. You can take a train. You can do this. You've got to sit down and say, What can I do? And you have to think about it when it's going to be busy because you can't think about it when it's slow. And one of the things I talk about all the time is preparing yourself for growth. I feel like in all my years of teaching and mentoring, photographers don't plan for growth. They're so focused on the here and now. I have no money. My bank account's low. No one knows who I am. I don't have enough clients. They're so focused on that that they can't see the future. Well, the future is very bright and very successful and you're making a lot of money because you have been working diligently at your business. So while you may, whoever's asking this question, I don't know what phase of your life is in, so it's really hard for me to answer a question when, are you just starting out? Do you have a loyal clientele? Have you been around 10 years? Do people know your name? Do you have a brand? Will anyone travel to you? Because I've had people fly in to take photos with me. So I could say that my location doesn't matter. I've been doing this a long time. I have a good name. I think I can market my work anywhere. Someone starting out who maybe people don't know them and they haven't built that name yet may feel like they're trapped to their town. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think you can command the work and people will find you and go to you. With that being said, if you're just starting out, you want to be in an area that you can draw people in. See, I don't even know if I answered that question right. Because, again, it depends on what stage of life. What? I already forgot the question. (laughs) I did know the question was if they had school-aged children, should they stay close? And that's kind of where I was going with prepare yourself for growth. If you do have school-aged children, especially now, kids are homeschooled, they're hybrid, they're in school. I don't even know where these kids are. My kids... I have to ask them every single day, are you in school? Are you home? I don't even know. I'm exhausted thinking about my kids' schedules. And they're teenagers now. So if I had little kids, and let's say it's not COVID, and let's say I'm starting out, I would probably stay close to home because parent to parent, your your kids need you. They need my best conversations with my kids have been on the car ride home from pickup or on the car ride to school, um, picking them up from parties, being able to be the first point of contact after the end of the day so that they have someone to connect to. Um, Taking walks with my daughters to the preschool. We had more conversations in the walks to preschool. My son driving him to Ocean Junior High. Those 15, 20 minute car rides were priceless to me. So if I was in a town that I felt I couldn't market my work and the kids' school were here, that would be challenging for me. I don't, I don't know what I would do. I, I just feel like I want to stay close to my kids. Now, the other part of the question was, the first part of the question was what? I don't remember. I digress a lot. Uh, so as my lease is up and I'm rebranding my business as a full service luxury portrait studio, mm, how right. important is the location of my studio for potential clients? Yeah, so, you know, I want to I want to talk to you. I want to pick up the phone. I want to ask where you live. I want to ask how long you've been in business. You're rebranding. What are you rebranding? Are you rebranding the design, the look, the feel, the colors, or are you rebranding your offerings? Um, what are you changing? Are you specializing in something? Who is your clientele? Where are do they come from now, and where do you want them to come from? There's so many questions that go down the line because let's say I'm here, okay, and let's say I'm rebranding, and let's just say that the clientele that I'm targeting in my rebrand is all in Los Angeles. 
well, would it make sense for me to get a studio in the Los Angeles? Or would it make sense for me to build this such an amazing studio here, but market in Los Angeles in such a way that people have to drive to the OC? So for here, that's not uncommon. If you're an OC, like my, for example, my son, he's always rents lenses. Every trip he goes, if he's going skiing for the weekend, he will rent a lens. He just was a big bear. He rented a lens. He rented a camera. That's his thing. So he always goes to LA to get his gear. Oh, Alex, can they still hear me? Yeah, so it's the camera time let up for 30 minutes. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Little glitch. Alex, you need a little timer. So my son always goes to LA to get his gear. Why? Because he can't find the right gear here. Sometimes he can, but 90% of the time he has to go to LA. Do the people in LA that are renting his gear say, well, no one in OC is going to find us, so we should move to OC? No. They go, I live in LA. I work in LA. This is the gear that I rent. If someone wants to rent it, they'll come get it. And I'm sure they're very successful. Photography studio is a luxury business. You may say, well, Anna, equipment is a luxury business. Well, actually, it could be. Sometimes people are renting it for a luxury, and sometimes people are renting it for necessity. So I would want to know what kind of rebranding you're doing, but without knowing any of the answers to those questions that I listed, sit down and say, you're rebranding why? Fill in the blank. Why are you rebranding? What are you rebranding? Your services, your offerings, your style, your design. To who are you targeting in that rebranding? Who is your clientele? Where, you know, it's that who, what, where, when and you learned in school. Where does that clientele live? Does that clientele live in your area or do they live an hour away? And why? Why are you rebranding? Because you want to reach this particular clientele? Because you're bored of your work and you want to try new things? Because you're going a different direction? Because you're with a partner and you're no longer with them? Because your styles have changed? Your tastes have changed? Because you weren't making enough money before? There's so many reasons why. So my advice to whoever answered to ask that question is sit down with a notebook. I'm a big notebook girl. I have like six of them. Sit down and answer every single one of those questions and you will find the answers. That was a long one, sorry. Okay, and she says she, this is only going to be 30 minutes. We'll see. <laughs> Next question. For those that do not have studios, what are some things we can do for our clients that would stand out? Client gifts or goodie bags, maybe? I, th I feel like we might have answered this last time. Too. Did we answer it last time? Yeah, because I, I know you definitely gave me duplicates from last time. I don't remember answering about goodie bags. Well, I think the question might have, it might have been oh, something Oh, but I similar. may not have answered it. Yeah. I know I didn't answer a question about goodie bags. So what can you do to make your clients special? I mean, anything you do from... Well, well the, the question was, what can you do to stand out if they don't have studios? Yeah, okay, so if you don't have a studio, how you stand out, you don't need a studio to stand out. Standing out is customer service. It's treating your clients like you care about them and respect them and value their business and you listen to them and you pay attention to them. And we all get busy and we'll all have the best intention. I think photographers, we have good intentions and we so want to write a thank you note and we want to give a little gift and then life gets busy and you just don't. And it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It doesn't mean that you're a bad business. It means that you didn't prepare yourself for growth and you just got busy or you just are the only person running your ship and you don't have anyone else to help you. So as far as making your clients feel special, there's so many different ways. And you wanna know one way to really find out? Ask your clients. You know, you can do all sorts of things. Like I have my seamstress make these little scented sachets because I like things that smell nice. So when I mail a client's order, they get a little scented sachet in their box because I feel like when they open their prints, it's gonna smell amazing. And then they can use that sachet in their, in their drawers. And I love them, I love them. So for Christmas time, we made a, a bunch of Christmas sachets to put in their orders. Uh, if I run out of those, I have backup lavender sachets. 
Uh, years ago, we did um, a free lip balm. Uh, one of the thank yous that I do for my clients is I'll do 20% off gift certificate specials. I like to do those because I feel like it, it gives people a reason to save because I'm not the cheapest photographer on the block. So I'll tell my clients, okay, you get 20% off any session you want. And I have people buy it and use it two years later. And it makes me feel good because I feel like I can give my clients incentives and ideas to come and see me. Uh, gifts, thank you notes. I remember years ago we used to do free thank you cards in their orders. Um, you know, responding to their emails, super important. Just imagine you're the customer. Anything that you could possibly want, um, do for your client. And I think you'll stand out. And I think that's regardless of whether you have a studio or whether you're home or you're standing on the street. Next question. Next question. What would you say your business, oh, would you say your business picked up more when you got a studio versus in-home or outside sessions? Okay, would, did my business improve once I got a studio versus home or outdoor sessions? Yes, for sure, bar none, absolutely. When, you know, it's the hustle. I've been hustling for 20 years and I, I hesitate in ask, answering this question because Every time you answer a question, there's always going to be opposition, exceptions. There's always going to be people that say, well, for me, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, et cetera, et cetera. There's no one size fits all. I mean, I think we've, I think we've learned that in the past year or two, that there is no one size fits all. There is no one right answer. It depends. Where do you live? Are you in the United States? Is, are you in a different country? Um, how are you marketing? Marketing, it's always, it's always about marketing. How do people find you? Are you by referral? Are you by your doctor's display? There's so many different reasons. I know very successful photographers that work out of their home. That, you know, their home, they put on slippers and they go to their garage or their spare bedroom or their loft and they're extremely successful. I remember when I was living in New York and there was a headshot photographer and she was a cousin to my husband and she did our engagement photos. And she was phenomenal. She was top, top, top headshot photographer in New York. Her studio was, if you know anything about New York City, her studio was probably the size of this corner of this room. It was her studio in her home. It was kind of like the bed's down when you're sleeping and then it's up when you're not sleeping. I remember she drew the curtains down with a blackout curtain, put up some lights, and she was a studio. And the actual shooting area was literally the size of the corner of this room that I'm in. I still have those pictures to this day. They were some of my favorite shots. She, I remember her promo cards, like yesterday, she had this six by nine headshot promo card with all these headshots on it and her name. And I remember touching that card over and over and over for years because I hadn't, I wasn't pro when I met her. And I would run my fingers over it. Like when I started out, I was in love with the printed press. I still am. So anytime anyone would give me anything, I would save it. I, st I still have it. I just would just stare at it over and over again. She had a great brand. Her, her name was right there. I know that she had celebrities in her apartment and no one cared. No one said, oh, I wish you had a storefront studio. At that time in New York City, you couldn't afford to do that. You couldn't, have, there's no photographer that could afford to have a storefront studio. It just wasn't possible. She had an extremely successful business. She's long since retired by now and she did phenomenal. So it really depends on your area. For me, I've worked everywhere. I've worked with nothing, out of a condo, out of my home, out of my garage, clients' homes. I rented this corner space in a camera studio. Oh, stories I could tell you. I've done everything. For me personally, when I got my first studio, it felt like home. It still does. Every time I walk through my door in my studio, even though I could tell you a million things wrong with my studio, 
I, it's my studio. I love it. It's a second home to me. There, my clients' kids think I live here. I mean, I do have a play kitchen. They think I live here all the time. They're always like, I want to go to Anna Banana's home. <laughs> she has a kitchen and coffee and all sorts of things. Why wouldn't I live here? Um, so I, I love my space. Do I want a bigger space? Yes. Do I want natural light? Yes. Do I want lofts? Yes. Do I want a recording studio? Yes. There, I could give you a wish list of 5,000 things, and if I get them all, I'd probably still want 5,000 more things. Your place that you work has to feel good. It has to make you want to create. It has to make you want to be there. Because if you want to be there and you can create, your clients will want to be there and nothing else will matter. I know people that can create out of the corner of a garage with natural light streaming in. I, I, there isn't a studio I haven't seen and the work that they can create and the people that can attract them make it all worth it. So for me, yes, it made my business grow. I um, double, tripled my income, my clientele, established a name, a brand in my studio. But people book me without ever seeing my studio. And almost every day a client will come in here and they'll go, wow. The, the woman this morning with the newborn, she asked me last night, oh, is there anything I need to bring? And I said, no, just show up with your baby. And she's like, are you sure? Can I bring you anything? And I said, no. And then when she arrived, she was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I didn't bring anything. She had told her husband, like, I feel like I should bring something. She'd never seen my studio. She didn't even know where it was. And so I feel like now, because I'm established, People will come to me not really knowing where Old Town Tustin is, not really knowing where my studio is. I could be in an industrial place. I'm not in an industrial place or certain areas because I don't feel safe there. And I need to be feel safe and I need to not look over my shoulder at night. And I need to feel, have a safe place that I can bring my children to. So I think to me that trumps everything. I need to feel safe, I need to feel secure, I need to be able to bring my children here and I need to be able to create. If I can do all of those things, I can have a successful business. So you need to ask yourself the same thing. Can you create in your area? Is it a place that makes you feel so good? Like you just can't wait to pick up the camera. And when your clients leave you, are they hugging you and saying thank you? If they are, that's all that matters. Okay, Next do you question. want to do some online ones? Sure. I was like, are we almost done? <laughs> Not even close. Uh, so I guess we start from the very beginning from Facebook. Uh, so it doesn't show me the names, fortunately. But, it's uh, okay. I don't want to see names. It's okay. better if I don't know who's asking okay. questions. Uh, this one's asked about today. Are you doing Q&As to increase traffic to your pages? I've heard it helps, except I absolutely hate being in videos. I am not doing Q&A to increase my pages. Nope. I'm doing Q&A because I get asked questions every single day around the world in every single medium that I show my work at. I could pick up my phone right now and look at my 5,000 Instagram accounts because I have a lot of them. Well, on your phone, it only lets you have so many accounts. So my phone, I can only access, oh, three, six, nine. I can only access nine of my Instagram accounts. And I have more than that. And each of those Instagram accounts has DMs and people post stories and everything like that. And every single day, I could probably pop in my DM right now, and I'm sure there's a question there. And, um, <laughs> oh, I was gonna, I just saw a question somewhere in my DM. See, then I'll just get lost in my DMs. Um, on my Facebook, I actually turned off to message me, except I think one of my, I think on my personal, you can't do that. And all, all of my business pages, is it has an autoresponder that says, please email me with questions because we were getting flooded on the Facebook pages. I get emails every single day, anywhere from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 emails. I mean, it's endless of questions all around the world. Um, so that's why I'm doing it because... Alex and I talk about a lot of things on the side, like, oh, we should do this. We should do regular podcasts. We should do this. And many times the question is repeat. I get the same question over and over and over again. How do you market? I get this question every single day. Um, and where do you get your products from? I get that one every single day. How do you pose a newborn baby every single day? Where do you start in newborn photography? All these questions every day. I just finished writing a book, um, Newborn Photography, Love and Light, The Practical Process. It is a 232-page book 
that was released last weekend. It was a book I had written a year ago before COVID. I had to take the book off the shelves and rewrite it all over again. It turned into a 232 page book. We have printed book, PDF form, and audio. And you can find that book at thecreativenewborn.com. And that book is frustrating to me because I want to write five more because it doesn't answer every question. It's a really good getting started book, 232 pages. A lot of brain dumping, a lot of me going back into the studio, photographing things for the book, explaining things, rewriting it. We spent seven hours recording the audio. And even when I was done, I was like, oh, but I want to say this, 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 this. And I'm working on another book called Wrapped about rapping, and then I'm working on another book called Marketing. So it's like each project leads to the next. So the Q&A is, is not to increase traffic because I, I don't really care about traffic, to be honest with you. I don't really care about that. What I care about is the clients calling me to book sessions, and most of that is from referral of existing clients in my OB display. It's not from Facebook traffic. But I think it is a good way for engagement. Absolutely. Talk to any social curator and they will tell you, connect with your audience, go live and be consistent and you'll increase your engagement. So yeah, if you're looking to increase your engagement and to get more followers or whatever your reason, see now I want to go through another series of questions. Why do you want more followers? Who are you trying to get to follow you? What is the purpose of them following you? What is the end result? That'll lead me to another series of questions um, to find out what is the best strategy for you. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was going to be a quick question. Too. <laughs> I really try. Okay. Uh, do you post images while shooting with Lightroom? I'm not sure I understand that question completely. Do I post, post images, images while, while shooting with Lightroom? I don't know what that question is. Yeah, as I before I read it first, and I was like, oh, that's okay. And then I read it as I was reading it out loud, and I'm like, wait, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't. <laughs> uh, maybe they're talking about live shooting. Maybe uh, that's what I, I thought at first when I first read it, but mm -hmm. the second time I read it, it didn't make as much yeah, sense. Yeah, and I I don't do live shooting unless I'm live <laughs> shooting. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know about that one. Sorry. So yeah, if that was what you were asking, then, then no, no, she does not. Uh, let me see. Until what age, two to three weeks, froggy pose is safe for newborn? I can't answer that question. What age, two to three weeks, is safe for froggy is super hard to answer because every baby is so different. Froggy position is when they're like this. And... Some babies will do it and some babies will not. You never want to force a baby in the position. I mean, I've had two-month-olds do froggy. If you're on Facebook, you'll see people get their two-year-olds to do it. I think that it also depends if the baby premature. I think once you get past two months, they're not going to want to do it because to get that position, they need to be in a nice, sleepy position. Although I've done it with babies wide awake. They need to be flexible because you're not forcing. You're just stretching, you know, their body in that position. And past two months, they're going to start to get bigger and their bellies are bigger and they're chubbier. And it's just, they're just not flexible. Their bones are hardening. Every day as a newborn grows, their bones are hardening. And so... If someone came in with to me with a three-month-old and said, would you attempt froggy, I'd go, mm, I mean, I could try it, but the chances of success rate are slim to none. And, um, yeah, that's the answer to that. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question. Uh, what are your settings normally when shooting outdoor sessions with no strobe lighting? Tough one. I feel like I'm on like a game show. Like, can she answer this question? What are my settings shooting on location? Oh, then I'm just gonna give you a list of questions. What am I shooting? What time of the day am I shooting? What camera am I holding? What lens am I using? What is the purpose of the shoot? It completely varies. You know, when I teach workshops, I just finished one this morning. 
I um, will go over my settings. I conducted a four hour workshop this morning and never took my camera off 200, 200, 2.8. When I'm shooting on location, uh, it really varies. If I'm at the beach and I'm 60 to 90 minutes before sunset, or if I'm shooting in the trees, at the tree farm an hour before sunset, my settings are gonna be completely different. I'm a super fast shooter, so outside I want a good shutter speed. So I'm usually not less than 250, just because there's no reason to be. I'm not gonna compromise on my shutter for a blurry image. Um, I don't use a tripod, so for me, I'm going to make sure that my shutter is strong because I'm moving a lot. Then I'm going to look at my aperture next, and my aperture is going to depend on what subject am I doing. Is it a child sitting on a stool at the beach and I want everything blurry in the background? Am I at 3.5? And if I'm at 3.5, am I losing light? Is the sun going down? Am I at 400 ISO? I could be, and then the sun is setting, and I could be 800 ISO. It just depends. I, I wish I could give you a magic number, but when you're shooting a natural light, your brain is constantly adjusting. I usually, like I said, take care of the shutter. Is your subject standing still or moving? Then my aperture is going to equate to how many people are in the subject, or in the frame. Um, are they moving as well? Do what is my depth of field? Do I want it shallow or do I want a nice strong depth of field to see everything? Um, and then of course my light factor. Am I going to increase my ISO? What is it that I want to do? So I wish I could answer that question. Come on and shoot with me and I can show you in person. Okay, last one online. Uh, where do you publish or promote a model call? You know, you need a good network. So if you don't have a mailing list, you need to get one yesterday. I actually did a mini course on mailing lists. You can go to bellybabyschool.com. I did a mini course on mailing lists because that, goodness, that's been the number one question for the past 10 years is where do I, how do I promote? Where do I post my model calls? You need a network. You need a fan base. You need a tribe. You need a tribe. You need, whether it's a private VIP Facebook group for your clients or whether it's a mailing list or whether it's a social page that has a lot of activity. You need somewhere where your tribe, your people, your fan base can hear from you. Because, and it has to be more than one because we assume that, oh, I post something on Facebook, everyone's going to see it and then no one sees it. Oh, I'm going to send out the newsletter, everyone's going to click on it and then people click on it but they don't read it. Oh, I'm going to post on Instagram. It'll go viral and everyone will share it. And then you get a double tap and that's it. You need to, number one, find out where your fan base is the strongest. And then number two, always make sure you're posting in two or three places. For me, it's a little bit different because I've been around a long time. When I first started out, my very first model call was with my OBGYN, my female doctor's office, because she had access to maternity and newborns all the time. So she was my very first point of contact in my career. She has since passed of cancer a long time ago. She was like my number one who I went to for model calls. And then over the years, it was my newsletter. Then it was just clients, hey, reaching out. I know you have a lot of friends that are having babies. Do you know anyone? Sending direct email to some of your clients. We, we used to call them the town criers. You need to be in touch with the town criers. The town criers are people in your town that everybody knows. They're the presidents of the PTA. They're the one coordinating the moms group. They're the ones that anything social or things that are happening in your town, that person is in charge. Every town has their town criers. And I remember years ago, I had some key clients that I called my town criers. They were everywhere. I'd run into them at parks. They were head of the mommy groups, the PTA. They were everybody. They were that chick click, that, that girl click that I was never really a part of because I'm not social. You have no introverts and extroverts, and I'm very much an introvert. Um, I am not an extrovert, and people think I am all the time. I am not. Just because I teach and I'm out there a lot, um, that's just because I feel like I have a job to do. I am very much an introvert, so I'm not going to go and approach people on the street. I'm not going to be the one all over town going, come to my party and I'm having a New Year's ball. That will never be me. So I had to rely on people that did do that. Now, it, 
I'll vary. Sometimes I'll post it on Facebook, and if I fill the model call, then I'll remove it pretty quickly. Sometimes uh, if I don't, I'll go to Instagram, fill that, and fill it real quickly. Right now, I'm kind of on a mission. If you follow me at all on Facebook, yesterday I made a post on my personal Facebook page. And just so you know, Facebook created like five Anna Brandt Facebook pages. I have like my regular Facebook Anna Brandt page that I've had forever that has like the 5,000 friends limit. And then I have my Anna Brandt Photography Facebook page, my Belly Baby Love page, Facebook page, and five million other Facebook pages. But the name Anna Brandt, one day, I noticed that Facebook literally, I think, added three or four more Anna Brandt pages. And there was a time where I was like, okay, I guess I'll try to fill all these pages. So every time someone tags me, they tag the wrong page. Every time. Every time. If someone says, where'd you get that gown from? They'll just say Anna Brand. If someone says, where did you learn how to market? They'll just go Anna Brand. And every single time, it's, I don't even know what page it's pointing to. It's super frustrating for me. If I could just have one Anna Brand page, I would be super happy. So for me, it's a little bit more complicated, but here's the thing on my personal Anna Brand page, whatever that is, I think it's Anna Maria Brand. I posted yesterday that I wanted to reach out to low-income mothers for my model calls. The reason was I was getting ready to do a model call for, I had a clinic this morning, and then I'm doing private mentoring next week. And so I needed some models. Now, I've just photographed my clients. I could have easily called clients that are on the books for this week or next week and called them, or I could have called my OB. I did post it on Instagram and I did post it on Facebook, but I kind of was like, you know, I would rather reach out to people that can't afford photography. And the reason I felt so strong, it was just, oh, I'm gonna try to say this without getting emotional. It just kind of hit me yesterday. Like when I was posting this model call, and a lot of the things that come to me, come to me at really weird times of the day. And people, they think I just, I don't know, they think I just pull these things out of my head, and I guess I do. But it's because I'll have, a quiet moment and I can think about what I'm doing. And I was kind of feeling like, well, I would rather, because my model calls are free sessions, right? I don't know if yours are. I would rather give free sessions to those who just can't afford it. And a lot of my clients might say the same, but I mean, and these may be my clients as well, because I have a very wide range of clients. I mean, people that can't, they don't know where their next meal is coming from. Pregnant mothers who I see on the street. I was in LA yesterday buying fabric and I saw all these children on the street. They should be in school. And I just wanted to scoop them all up. And so I just felt like, okay, maybe that's where I got it from. Maybe because I was in LA and I saw that. And I, I saw these, these children and this mom holding a baby and I just, I just wanted to just take her home. And so maybe that's where it came from. So I just thought maybe I'm going to just post, I have a big network. Let me just see who's out there. And maybe they can put me in touch with people, women that are pregnant, women that have had babies that they, they can't even afford milk. And I would rather do my model call for them. Not discounting my amazing clients and not discounting people that maybe money is tight. Not discounting, not trying to talk about privilege. It has nothing to do with that. It just has to do with me giving back and me saying, hey, I want to reach out a little bit to my community. For years, I worked with the Heart Gallery and I would photograph kids that wanted to be adopted because I'm adopted. And so I would volunteer my time to photograph them. And then the Heart Gallery would print an enlargement of them and show it at a gala and they would get adopted. And I did that for years. And that was a result of a client coming to me saying, Anna, I know you've been looking for a charity. And it's true. I had been looking for a charity for five years and none of the charities were sticking with me. I couldn't, I just didn't want to donate to this or that just because. I wanted to get back to something that I could completely relate to. And I guess I had mentioned mentioned it to this client and a couple years went by and she just called me out of the blue and she goes, I remember you mentioning that you wanted to be, you know, um, a part of a charity and I'm, I'm a chairman for the Heart Gallery and so I think that you would want to be a part of it. And so um, I did, I, for years, for years, it was amazing. Um, 
And so I also remember when my son was eight, I know I'm really digressing now, but he, the night he jumped over a, a pole and fell flat on his face and had to go to the ER and broke his whole face. He's obviously fine now. That particular night, I was volunteering for an organization for unwed mothers. And it was that just that, unwed mother, unwed young mothers. So I think they were all under 25. So from 15 to 25. And they were either pregnant or had a baby. And I volunteered my time to just do shoot with them. And I, there were 25 in my studio when I got the 911 call that my son was, you know, face down on the pavement. Odd story, I was interviewing a girl that night um, I'll never forget her. I handed her my camera, this is during an interview, and said, here you go, and went to the hospital. I don't even remember what happened after that. Stephanie, who still works with me, could probably tell you what happened after that. I don't even remember. But I remember that organization, and I thought, if someone had done that for my biological mother, Maybe I would have photos because I'm, I'm pretty sure she couldn't have afforded it to get pregnancy photos. I'm sure no one was doing it then, certainly not for free. And she wouldn't have been able to take me for newborn photos. And then I went into foster care and then I was adopted. So I, I didn't come with photos. So back to model calls. I think that you need to build a network. You need to build a tribe. You need to reach out. A lot of people reached out to me yesterday and sent me some amazing contacts. I'm curious as to where it'll take me in my career and to the people that I'll meet. Maybe that'll be another book, I don't know. Um, but you've gotta be like an octopus. You've got eight arms and you've gotta put them out everywhere. And it's like if an octopus is looking for food and they're in the ocean, what's happening? They're all going out and looking for something. And one sees food and they bring it in. And the other sees maybe not food and predator and scoops back in. You've got to be the octopus. And you've got to kind of have hands everywhere and see, see who grabs what hand and see where it goes. Build a network, build a tribe, build a following, and then network to those. I said this is going to be like 20 to 30 minutes, right? <laughs> We're almost done, right? <laughs> no? Not really. I mean, Alex is shaking his we've head. Done, we've only done three of the <laughs> questions that you gave me to put up. And there's like a hundred questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, another one of the ones you gave me? Sorry. Yeah, I was getting a call and I'm just trying to tell them I'm, I'm on live. Um... Okay, I just wanted to say, my daughter's coming in from school, and I just wanted to say that I'm live so she can come into the studio. Okay. okay. I think this next year almost are very similar. Uh, this person, I'm new to baby photography. What are basic requirements that start as a newborn, or to start as a newborn photographer? I think the next question is similar. Let me check real quick. Yeah, so any question, any suggestions for beginner photographers that you wish you someone told you about? So what I wish things. someone would have told me about when you're starting newborn photography and where to start newborn photography. Wow. It's hard for me to answer that because I started 20 years ago and everything is completely different now. Completely. I wish someone... 20 years ago would have told me what my life is going to look, work, look like 20 years from now. I would have prepared a little bit better, I think. Maybe not. Um, all right, let's pretend I'm just starting out now. Let's pretend. Something I wish someone would have told me. All right, I'm just going to tell you things that you have to have. Yeah, and and the, yeah, the, the first question was, what are some basic requirements to start? Yeah. Loaded questions because newborn photography uh, has a lot of liability to it. I mean, I feel like any photography does. But to me, of all the photography, newborn is the most sensitive for so many reasons. One is that you're dealing with the tiniest human beings on the planet. 
the most sensitive. You don't want anything to happen to that baby in your care. It's just not an option. It's just not. So from a legality standpoint, having a contract and having a client sign a contract and having responsibilities of that contract and having insurance that supports you and your clientele are kind of first and foremost. Then you get on things that may seem not important but are really important, like a good camera strap. I can't tell you how many photographers I train and they don't have a camera strap. And I'm just like, this camera weighs, how much do cameras weigh? Five pounds? No, like two. two pounds? I feel they feel like five pounds. When you start adding the lens and the battery booster and everything else, four or five pounds, how much does a baby weigh? Seven to nine pounds. So you're dealing with a piece of equipment that is, you know, could cause a lot of damage to a baby if that piece of equipment ever fell on a baby. So things like safety, you know, your lights. Are you doing natural light or studio light? Your lights are, could they fall over on a tripod? Do you have sandbags on them? Um, are you doing flash on your camera? I wouldn't point flash to a baby's eyes. Or are you going to bounce and diffuse? Have you been trained? If you haven't been trained, you need some type of training to just understand from a safety aspect because the internet is so deceiving. You see a baby hanging on a tree branch, you assume the baby's hanging on a tree branch. I know when I started out, there was a lot of things that I saw that I thought were really done. And now with digital, it's even more confusing to the average client. They don't, they don't know. If you're not a photographer, they don't know. And I, the reason I know they don't know is because almost every day when I do a dream capture, capture image, which is a composite, I'll then hang the dream catcher later without the baby and the client will usually look like, hmm, I wonder what they're doing. And I'll say, oh, we're making a composite. And they'll go, oh, I thought you just hung the baby. Like I thought you just suspended the baby in the air. And I'm like, oh no. And I still get asked that question. So there's kind of you know responsibility to make sure you're educated in the poses you're trying to attempt. Um, is, is the pose, is that something that is composite? Is it a digital image? Is that safely done? So I, I feel now with the newborn photography, you need training. You know, 20 years ago, there wasn't training. There just wasn't. And we just did the best that we could. Had there been training, I would have taken it. That would have been the first thing. When I want to learn something, I go to look for training. And I, you know, it's funny. My son is very much like this. If you ever know my son, this is him all day long. And people look at him like, oh, he's, he's a kid. Well, he's not a kid anymore. He's 20. He's just doing social. But he's not. 99% of the time, if you look at my son, he's either listening to a podcast or watching a how-to YouTube. He's literally building his studio from the bottom up. He was putting in fiberglass a week ago, learning on YouTube. He's building a, he already built a podcast room. He's building a recording studio and he's building his own rental studio and he's doing everything from the ceiling tiles. Last week it was one in the morning, he was stapling soundboards. He's building it. He did the floor himself. He's building his own tables. Everything he's learning is on YouTube. If if someone says, hey, the other day I was like Googling um, bows because I was having a problem with my bow. Newborn photography is like that. You need to learn. If you say, I want to do how to do newborn photography, you need to learn. I want to know how to make pasta in five minutes. You need to learn. You need to read the instructions on the box of pasta and then maybe watch Cooking with Rachel Ray. Newborn photography is that and so much more. I would pick up every book on the subject. I would look at every YouTube video I could on the subject. I would take an in-person training on the subject. I would do that before anything else because I meet so many photographers. They come in with a $1,000 camera bag, a $5,000 camera. They've got the cutest, latest photographer t-shirt. They've, they've like indulged in everything but how to actually photograph newborns. And when I started photography, I bought every book I could on, if there was a maternity book, I bought it. If there was lighting, I bought it. I have boxes and boxes of books. And I found maternity books, um, found books on lighting. And then I would watch videos. And I would take classes. I took many college courses. I took intensive lighting workshops. Um, 
I think the only thing is I've never been mentored by somebody, but I feel like there's been a lot of people in my life that have mentored me in different ways, but I've never personally sought a mentorship with somebody. I think that's super important because, you know, I was mentoring somebody last night and she's been around a long time and she's wedding business and newborn business. And I mean, she's been around at least 10 years and she's like, you know, I felt kind of silly coming to you for mentoring because I've been doing this for a while. And I thought she said she was seeking help from just, Facebook and other people and then thought, oh, wait, why don't I check if Anna Brent has mentoring? And she went on my workshops page and thought I did mentoring. And literally we started chatting and she signed up for mentoring like Tuesday and we had our first call yesterday. And she was like, I don't know what took me so long to go to mentoring with you. She goes, I think it's because I've been around a while. So I thought I don't need it. And I go, that's exactly why you need it. I said, I've, I mentor people that are brand new starting out that have nothing and then I mentor people that have been doing this 10 or 20 years ago. Anna, I've hit a roadblock in my business. Anna, COVID shut me down. Anna, my husband passed away. Or I'm divorced. Or, I mean, you name it, I've heard it. And I need to pivot, switch, regroup, rebrand. Are my images okay? What am I doing wrong? Um, do I hire help? What are my pricing? Do I get a studio? Do I work out of my home? Just on and on and on and on and on. And we don't many times seek help because... Maybe we say we can't afford it and then it's a disastrous situation and you end up losing more money. So you need to get trained. I cannot emphasize that enough. I am working on a newborn certification program with my name because for years I've been, I get asked every day for a referral. So every day someone will say, do you know somebody in Norwalk, Connecticut? Do you know somebody in Brooklyn, New York? Do you know somebody in Dubai? Can you refer a uh, one of your students in Israel. The reason is, is because I've trained in 32 countries and I don't even know how many states, not all of them, but most of them. And so people know that. And so they say, I want to be trained by someone from you. Like one of my mentorees who came for mentoring from Malaysia, Mabel, she came from Malaysia to here to mentor. And then I went there and then she ended up assisting me and we've been working together for years. She would tell me that people would call her up saying, were you trained by Anna Brandt in California? And she was like, yes. And they would go to her because they knew my work and they knew that I was training her in a way that I worked. So I get a lot of referrals. I can't even answer all the ones that I get. Sometimes I can refer people pretty easily because a lot of my students take multiple classes with me. They'll do in-person, online, and many of them mentoring. So when I've kind of seen someone three different places, it's easy for me to refer to them. I can go, oh yeah, so-and-so, I've mentored her, trained with her, blah, 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 go to her. And I can be comfortable in her work. So there's an online training program, certification program that I'm developing right now. I wanted to release it last weekend, but I couldn't because I was finishing my book. I would like to say I'd release it this weekend, but I don't know if I can, but it'll be releasing very soon. You can go to annabrandonline.com, sign up for my newsletter so you're notified when it's been releasing. It'll take special account for those who have trained with me personally versus those who have trained with others and combine it all together and bring you through a series of questions and things like that. I think um, education is important. Training is important, whether you're reading every book that you can find, looking at every YouTube you can find, and then last but not least, you have to put what you're learning into good use. Seek out friends and family, seek out people you know, look for models, and above all, get an assistant. It kills me when people don't have help. And then practice with the very basic posing. You're wrapping safe poses, and don't try to do the more challenging ones until you've properly been trained. That was a really long answer. Alex always, always, always like, she said 15 minutes. I mean, I knew as soon as you said that, I'm like, I, I know it's not going to happen. I know. Okay. How many more do you want to do? Because we How have, many more we are have there? two more from the ones that you gave me. And okay. then there's literally like probably 20 or 30 online. All right. I'm going to, let's do speed round. Okay. Ready? She says speed round, but it's going to be just as slow. <laughs> I'm going to try. Let's do the, the ones that I sent you because those, those are people who had directly sent okay. me. Okay. Next right. one. When you first started, did you ever use a speed light flash? Can it work the same as your pro photo flash? Okay. Yes, no, yes, no. Okay. So when I first started, I was all natural light, no anything. Natural light. I did learn to use a speed light. I had the 640EX, I don't know, whatever it is. I probably still have it in my closet or my car somewhere. I had two of them. 
And I used to use it on the beach. Oh man, because I took a lighting workshop and we learned how to do off camera flash. So then of course, when you learn something, you want to try it, I put it on my camera. Then I had to get a battery pack because I'd be shooting at the beach and I'd be like, smile, waiting for the recycle time of the flash. Oh, I can't tell you how many images I missed waiting for my flash to recycle. So then I'd bring extra batteries. Then I got a battery pack, would strap it to my waist, use the battery pack. And then I remember one day after doing that for like five years, only on location though, never use speed light in a studio. One day I saw someone else shooting on the beach in all natural light and I was like, I used to do that. And then I put my speed light away and literally never used it again. I used it a couple of times in home sessions, bouncing it off the ceiling because I would never directly point it at anybody. So I've used it bounce off the ceiling. I've never loved it. I know some people that are masters at off-camera flash, masters at speed lights. I know some people that try to use it with an umbrella because that's all they can afford and they figured it out, go for it. Light is light. I say all the time, learn how to use it. I'm not a fan. Once I get rid of them, I just was like, I don't need them. I don't like them. They give me a headache. But if you use them and you love them, and there's like books and videos and courses on the subject. So if you use them and you like them, go for it. I don't think it works the same as Profoto because it's not as powerful. The strobes are going to be way more powerful than a speed light. Okay, next question. That was faster. Uh, did you ever do gift bags for clients after their session? Do you feel having a studio increase your business income or clientele? Yes and yes. Yeah, I've had all sorts of things. I mean, it's 20 years, I've done everything. I've done gift bags, I've done gifts, I've done all sorts of things. Um, having a studio increased my clientele and my business, my financial, for sure, yes. But it also costs more. I could probably have more money in my pocket with no employees and no studio and no children but then I'd be really lonely and alone. So there you go. <laughs> My daughters said yesterday, they go, mom, you'd have so much money if you didn't have us. I said, I would, but I would be so lonely and sad and missing you so much. <laughs> okay. Okay, that was it for the ones you gave me, so now we can do the okay. online ones. Okay. Uh, let me see where we left off. Uh, what is your backlighting setup? Backlighting setup, lights on the background. Next question. <laughs> really, backlighting, white paper, lights on the background. I have a course on backlighting, bellybabyschool.com. People ask me all the time, backlighting, do you have lights in the front? No, then it's not backlighting. And that would be high key. So you can go to bellybabyschool.com and you can learn, see my backlighting course. And you, there's videos there, there's a guide there, there's everything there. Okay. When you were a one woman show, how many clients did you take per week? I wish I can remember. I wish if I look back, I would have kept a daily journal of every, well, I actually do still have all of my appointment calendars probably going back a really long time, unless they made me throw them away the last time we were boxing stuff up because my staff is always making me throw things away. But for a long time, I probably had like 10 years worth of manual calendars, you know, where I used to write the client's name down in a, a physical calendar, like manual calendar. I don't remember. With Evan, I mean, but let's see, I started before I had Evan. I would shoot child models and did a lot of headshots in my day. And I mean, I don't know. I was always busy, always shooting. I'm always busy. I have no idea. I wish I knew the answer to that question. Some weeks it was probably one, other weeks, five. I have no recollection whatsoever. I really don't. See how fast I'm going? I just don't know. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh,. What expense tracking software do you recommend for someone starting out? Expense tracking software for someone starting out. Are you only expense tracking or are you keeping track of your clients' 
contracts and invoices. Because if you're just tracking income and expense, QuickBooks, Quicken. I mean, for years when I started out, I was using Quicken. Now I have QuickBooks. Um, if you're looking for a, a customer database management system, I use Iris. Iris works. Um, but yeah, if I was just me and my camera, income and expense, Quicken. I used that for years and then went to QuickBooks. Then you could just export everything for your accountant. See how fast I'm going, Alex? Come on, speed yeah, up. What's the next fast. question? Do you know where I can get a used stand in baby where I can practice newborn photography? No, I don't, but you can reach out to Sarah Muffet, the founder of Stand in Baby, Sam, Sandra and Brendan, and ask them. I'm sure they know. Yeah, just go to standinbaby.com and reach out to them. I'm sure they'll be able to tell you. Or eBay. Photographers buy and sell groups. I have no idea. <laughs> Next question. See how fast I'm going? We're almost done. Mm. It's already been an hour, and I, I said we're going this for 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, this person is asking, uh, give me a, a scenario. You're doing an outdoor family session at golden hour. You're losing light and can't reshoot. What type of settings do you use to avoid the most noise grain? Okay, read that to me one more time. So the, the situation you're in is you're doing an outdoor family session at golden hour. You are losing light and cannot reshoot. What type of settings do you use to avoid the most noise slash grain? Well, I mean, I'm on a 5D Mark IV right now, and I have a, I have a 1DX. The 1DX is fantastic for low light. Fantastic. My 5D... I think I've gone up to like 3,000 ISO. I think I have. It wasn't amazing. Oh, it goes that high. Um, I mean, I probably don't want to be over 2,000. I get really bothered. I'd probably call the shoot. We're done. That's usually what I do. Yeah, but they said they cannot reshoot. Oh, but you're done. You're not <laughs> going to get any pictures. I would say keep a tripod in your car just in case and then do a lower shutter speed. Yeah, but I have like five Like if, if you I had absolutely nothing else. I know, no, no, no. But, like but how just, do they know that? Were they prepared ahead of time and they had tripods? No, that's why I said like just keep a tripod always in the car. And reflect. Well, reflect yeah. if there's nothing to reflect. And then just in case, like if you're in that situation, you have absolutely no other option, uh, lower your well, shutter speed. It's also speed. a good idea to have a backup speed light in your bag. Yeah, that too. Backup flash. You gotta have backups. See, I would have just called it. Be like, we're done because if I'm in a situation where I have a limited time and I can't reshoot, I'm gonna know that ahead of time and I know what pictures I have to get and I would have already accomplished them. So I could say, don't put yourself in that position. <laughs> if you're in that position or you find yourself in that position, don't ever get in that position again. Or if you think you might be in that position again, Put a speed light in your bag and a tripod. Okay. Okay, next question. Uh, this person, I live in France, but photographers here charge 110 euros, which is approximately $130 for a session with a with 20 digital images. I think that is to trash my work, but French people do not pay a lot. What would you do? Leave France. <laughs> To my friends, friends, you know I love you. Um, hmm. I hate questions like that because I get that all the time. And I have friends in France, so I know that's actually very true. Um, my question would be, are there any photographers in France charging more? And if so, why can't you be that person? I look for the Blue Ocean. If you've never read Blue Ocean, the book, go read it. There's a second one, a second one after the Blue Ocean one. I can't remember the second book. So Blue Ocean is, is finding areas that no one else is doing, being different. And, you know, I love, I love when people come to me, especially if I'm mentoring them, and they go, no one in my town is doing 
X, Y, Z. I go, perfect. Then be the person that is. Because it's like, let's say you're a small town and there's only fast food. And I was opening up a restaurant. I would open up a full, gorgeous dining restaurant with shows at night and private booths and curtains and balloon makers for the children. And I would, I would make it amazing because everyone would want to go to me because nothing like that exists, right? Too many times we're trying to be like everybody else. Well, no one's charging more than $130. No one's gonna pay more than that. My work is really good and they're trashing my work because they won't pay more than that. But are you marketing yourself and showing yourself with work that price isn't the option, price isn't the deciding factor? Because I've traveled all over the world and I gotta tell you, I've been in some of the poorest areas of the world and in some of the richest areas of the world. And in every single area, there are people that can afford nothing and there are people that can afford everything. In every country, every area. And so I would say, I'm pretty sure there are people in France that are willing to spend more than that. So my wish would be to find out who those people are and make my work so good that they have to pay more than 130 euros. They're gonna pay 250 euros for my work and I'm gonna be the top photographer in France and people will pay my dollar. That's what I would do. I know you're gonna say, Anna, that's not realistic, but honestly, that's what I would do. When I was in Mexico a couple of years ago, I was teaching 25 photographers. There was one photographer that had come to the United States to get her training, and I had met her at WPPI. She's now a Nikon ambassador, and she wasn't at the time, but she was a photographer that was determined to be educated. So she came over here, I mean, we're not that far, you know, learned her education, went to all the programs, and was, went back to Mexico and said she was going to do in-person sales and she was going to sell albums and books. So I'll never forget, gosh, this is probably like three or four years ago, and we're sitting in this room with 25 photographers and they're like, nobody does IPS here, Anna, nobody. Everybody wants all their images for a hundred dollars or a hundred pesos or whatever they're doing. Do they sell pesos over there? Yep. Pesos? Oh, I don't know. Still pesos? <laughs> still pesos? I don't know. <laughs> if I go to Mexico, I use dollars. Okay, so they still pesos, forgive me. Um, okay, so they're only going to pay 100 pesos or whatever. I don't even know what the value is. It's like, what is that? If, okay, whatever. <laughs> 1,000 pesos, whatever. The point is, they're not paying anything, okay? They're not paying anything. It's the same thing as the euros. And Anna, nobody, nobody is paying this. Nobody is doing in-person sales, and nobody will buy, buy an album. And that one person, I won't say her name, said, I am. I'm selling albums, I'm doing in-person sales. And they were all like, oh. it was like a gasp in the room. And I just kind of smiled because I knew her, she had been here for training. And I was like, exactly. When I was starting out, I was told 3% of the world controlled 97% of the wealth. I don't even know what the updated quote is, 1%. 1.5%, I don't even know what it is. I'm looking for that 1%. Why do you care about the other 98, 99%? And when I say, why do you care? It's not from a privileged perspective. If you wanna, there's different types of markets. I tell people all the time, do you wanna be McDonald's or do you wanna be fine dining? There's nothing wrong with my McDonald's. My kids love McDonald's. We all love their fries and Coke, everybody does. McDonald's is a zillion dollar em empire and they're not going anywhere anytime soon but you can go and get a full meal for a family of 10 for like $5. There's nothing wrong with McDonald's. Then you have fine dining. Unfortunately, a lot of the dining places are losing their business. But before COVID, you had fine dining where you get dressed up and you do hair and makeup and you sit down and you have a beautiful menu and people wait on you and they say, do you want still water or sparkling and put your, your napkin on your lap and you sit there and you're so excited and you have the best meal of your life that you've, it's probably equal to your electric bill and you probably won't have another meal like this for nine months later. 
There is room for both of those businesses. You have to determine which of those businesses you are and who your market is, who your audience is. And there's nothing wrong with either one of those markets. Do you want to be 1% or do you want to be 97%? Do you want to be all the photographers that are charging 130 euros or do you want to be that one photographer that's charging 350 euros and you have a six month wait for people to book you? It's not unattainable. There was a question that came in on my phone that said, you said in the past that you thought your children's, you bought your children's domain names and how did you go about doing that? Do they have full ownership of the site? Is it something you have to pay monthly for, yearly, or a one-time fee? That's actually a fabulous question. Just getting to try to keep it from happening. Alex, Alex, Alex. That's a fabulous question. I know, I'm really, I'm really going beyond. Um, and I kind of like that whoever asked me that question has obviously been paying attention. So thank you. Yes, that is true. While I was pregnant, um, I bought my domains for all of my children. I mean, I own like 200 domains. Um, but I bought their names. And you, at the time, I think I just went to networksolutions.com I think you can go anywhere, any buydomain.com, you can go anywhere and buy a domain. I mean, now we have hosting accounts and hosting companies and it's very complicated. So now we would use my service that I use, but pre all my life, when I was pregnant, I just went to whatever hosting company I did, typed in evanbrandt.com, bought it. And whatever hosting site you have will either have I don't think there's any lifetime fee. You pay annually, with privacy or without. I think I don't have privacy protection on it, uh, meaning anyone can see. You can go to whois.com and see who owns evanbrandt.com. It'll probably say me. And they, they, as far as they have full ownership of it, yeah, when they are ready. They all actually own their websites. With that being said, I pay the bill. So <laughs> that'll probably go on for a long time. Um, but they all, I don't touch Evan's site. He's built it. From We had, I think, originally built it, and then when he wanted to take over, he just learned how to build websites. Um, Ava, gosh, she's 15. I think it was two years ago she asked for ownership of her site, and we sat down next to each other, and I taught her how to edit her site in WordPress, so she knows how to do that now. Olivia, I believe, knows how to edit her own site. Um, so they own it. Um, they have full rights to it. They can do whatever they want, but you know, I'm their parents, so I, I modify it. And one day when they're old and gray, they can pay their own bill. Um, but yeah, I just, you know, prepare yourself for greatness and prepare your kids for even better greatness was always my philosophy is prepare yourself for growth, prepare a future for your children. And I always wanted, um, you know, when, when my son was born, his birth announcement was, the quote from Pablo Casal is that, you know, you could be a Michelangelo, dot, dot, dot. That's such a famous quote. I'd used it on his birth announcement. He was, he was my firstborn. And, and so I was like, he could be, he could be anything, but whatever he's going to be is going to be amazing because he's my son. And I still feel that way and he's 20. And my daughters, I think, are the most beautiful people on the planet inside and out. So I've always felt from the moment of conception that they were amazing and they would do amazing things and I wanted to prepare them for a life that would allow them to be amazing and have a voice in whatever they see fit. So I know it's a really long emotional answer, but when I start talking about my kids, I get all worked up. So I'm just so proud of them now because they, Ava got a GoPro at Christmas and she's like so excited and my son bought her a boat she's doing archery and Evan was mad at her last weekend because she found this this thing after Googling for her fingers because it hurts her hand. And he's like, you're supposed to go take it to the shop and they're supposed to do it. And she did it. She did it on her own. And he was so mad. He was like, why can't she take it to the shop? I was like, because she wants to do it on her own. He's like, she's never strung a bow before. And I'm like, Evan, have you ever built a studio from the ground up before? And he was like, well, no, but he was so annoying. And I was like, you know, you got to let people fly, give them wings. So she now has a GoPro and Olivia asked for final cut so she could edit videos and just give them, give them ways to learn and they will. I digressed again. <laughs> All right, we're going to wrap this up. Last, let's do five more and then we're done. That's like another hour. <laughs> I know. And I have to leave it. I have to be, uh, this one's kind of related. How did you first market yourself? What was your most successful marketing tool? 
My most successful marketing tool has been my OBGYN displays, hands down, bar none. I was just talking to my other doctors the other day because I've been ordering new canvases for their, their display and I have like 40 canvases in this OB office and they wanted a more diverse display to show more different skin tones, which is super challenging because I photograph babies of all races and they all have very similar skin tones, so it's very challenging. Um, but I had just emailed them a week ago saying, guess what, you guys are getting all new canvases, hopefully in about a month. I've been ordering them and they were so happy. They were like, yes, Anna, thank you so much. And I've been in this OB office since I was pregnant with Ava and she'll be 16 in March. So I think my OB displays, hands down, have been my best marketing. Second would be my referral program, but my clients don't refer me because I have a referral program. In fact, I feel like most of my clients forget that I have a referral program and, or don't even know I have a referral program. But I think that client referrals are right number two on the list. I get a lot of client referrals. Um, I mean, I shot for Parenting Magazine for seven years. I didn't say that I got a lot from that, but yeah, I think that's it. Okay, see, that's what I need. Alex is doing this. That's what I Wrap need, Alex. I need up. you to go... Wrap it up, Anna. Okay. We need music like they I do. I know. I, I was thinking of that. Like the yeah, Oscars Yeah, where you have Oscars your soundboard music. now. Yeah, yeah, the Oscars. Are we getting Oops. the Oscars this oh, year? I should put the soundboard on her. Is that Ava Brandt in the house? Are we getting the Oscars this year? Are we getting award shows this year? Not to digress. I love I don't know, award probably. shows. I don't think they're going to stop. That's what you they're need. probably going to be different, but... We need, okay. we need music. Anyway, okay. enough of that. What kinds of things... Uh, yeah. What kinds of things do you say in a thank you card to a client? I think I want to start doing this. Thank you for your business. So here's what you do. <laughs> Next question. Now here's what you do. This is what I used to do for years. You get an image of theirs. Well, it depends what kind of your budget you have. Let's say you have a budget. You take an image of your clients and you print it on a set of no blank note cards. The picture on the front is their image and the picture on the back is your logo and your branding. So I had my designer create one side of the card, drop the image in and the back, pretty design with my logo. Inside is blank. I would write a note on the first card, say thank you for your business. See, now my clients are gonna listen to this going, how come you're not doing this right now? I'll have to bring them back for 2021. I did this years ago. Okay, okay. I know my clients are going to be like, Anna, where are those note cards? Okay, okay, listen. And then I would take one out for their file so I would remember in case they wanted to order more because that did happen. And then I would give them the other 23 and say, this is my thank you gift. Because everybody that gets birthday gift, birthday gifts, baby gifts, they want to write a thank you note, right? So why not have them write the thank you note on the cute card with their baby image and your branding on the back? Then they don't even have to say who photographed this baby because you know because your information is on the back. The client gets cute baby cards because they have no time to go out and buy them. They can write their thank you notes. People get snail mail. They're happy. The world is good. Uh, I'm skipping down to one of the last questions on here. Um, this is good. I love all these questions. I wish we could do this all day. This is I said we're only going to do this 20 or 30 minutes. Jasmine the, Starr just does like 20 minute Q&A. This next one's the best but one. But I think Jasmine does them every week in my defense. And Jasmine, I love you, but I don't have time to do them every week. Not that she has time. She's very busy. But I don't know how she gets. I'm going to have to study how she gets them down to 20 minutes every week. Okay. Uh, so it doesn't show me who the Facebook user is here. But okay, I, good. I, I think, no, well, you'll see why in a second. Okay, but okay. I'm pretty sure I know who it was. Uh, it says... How do you get such amazing employees? <laughs> Is that Gina? Gina better get back to work. I think it's either Gina or Gabby. I think it's Gabby because then someone commented after that. Yeah. You guys need you need to be working out there. <laughs> oh, I'm pretty sure my amazing employees, I don't even know what they're doing out there. No comment on that question. We're still live five hours oh, later. Live? Still. Yeah. I'm going to just we skip around because there's so many questions. Uh, Come get your shoes, Estella. Alex said. <laughs> They're not in my view. Well, he said no, uh, you go where are they? They're over there. Oh, I was just telling you to be quiet. Oh, the client was here. Who was here? Eva Brandt. Oh, this is like hours ago. Oh, yeah. Hi, Eva Brandt. We happened in there. Oh. 
Are you saying my office is a mess? No, the other. Oh, the. My gosh, that has to be. You still have to go take that to storage. Alex has to take that to storage. All the holiday stuff is in the beauty room, and yeah, Heather has be appointments before, tomorrow. Before, like yesterday, we weren't doing this. <laughs> well, you know, things just aren't. Yeah. Really Ava's like, why are you slacking, right, Ava Brand? Are we slacking? Ava wants to know why we're slacking. Did you literally yell at me live to tell me to get to work? Yeah. Like most boring as how long have you been late? Uh, no phone calls, <laughs> no packages. I'm like It's been like an hour and a half. It's been like What are you what are you doing right now? Are you going over to the shop? It's brutal over there. We have to pack for me. I don't have to I don't <laughs> I will Okay, let's, let's wrap <laughs> this so live up, up okay? The, we're gonna walk the Bambina Gina, stickers over. Out. We're need to go finish. Walk, we're gonna go walk the Bambina stickers over because we know this is gonna be a while. <laughs> you could take all the holiday stuff to storage. We have like five storage units. Hi, Ava. We'll be back. Ava, you want to sleep in my area? It's so cozy back there. <laughs> okay, last question. Are we keeping that in or are we editing oh, I'm not editing this. How was school, Mama? Good. What did you do? Rock. Sorry, Alex. <laughs> Alex is like, good job, Eva. Um, I'm here. I'm waiting for your question, Alex. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you think doing a casting call to get more clients work? Okay, here we go. <laughs> Okay, because they're making fun of me because then I'm going to go into my teaching brain and be like, do you want to get more clients or do you want to produce more work to get more clients? Because you can get more clients by changing your marketing or increasing your advertising without doing free model calls. Or you can do free model calls because maybe you don't have enough work from clients to show and market and advertise, right? That's usually what people will say. So yes, that's the answer to that question. You need to be working, you need to be producing, you need to be creating. So I'm working on this new Mentor Me Challenge program where people will be held accountable every week with a new challenge for their model calls. I think I tried to do this a couple years ago and it just didn't work. So I'm doing it again in it a little differently so that people who will be in my Mentor Me group will receive, it's almost like, what would it be like? Like you're on a, like you're on an island for eight weeks. And I'm like, every week you have a challenge and you have to come back to me with this challenge, the results of this challenge. So that's gonna be the Mentor Me program. And so I feel like, you know, when I was mentoring a person last night, I was telling her, you need to be working. So I did advise her to do model calls, mainly because I wanted to see her work and be there on Skype and help her perfect her work. But I said, you need to be working, you need to be creating because the downside is now with social media is if people don't see you and you're not posting and you're not sharing, they assume you're not even open, especially with COVID. I get asked every single day, I'll get an email, are you open, are you not open? Is, is COVID affecting your business? Are you shooting? Because no one really even knows who's open, who's not, who's allowed to shoot. I mean, no one knows. So there's photographers that have close their business, that are not shooting anymore, that are not taking clients. So a lot of people come to me like, are you? Is that image you posted? Was that training? Was that you working? And no, I'm, I'm able to work. I'm in California, but I'm able to work. But, but people don't know that. And with social, if you're not posting regularly and you're not producing content and they're not seeing your work, then they probably won't call you. They'll kind of forget about you. It's kind of sad. You have to be... I've said a hundred times, marketing is every breath that you breathe. You have to show up every day producing content, whether it's writing, blog posting, sharing, pinning, posting, tagging. Um, you've got to be creating. You've got to be creating work, whether it's painting a backdrop, making a headband, sewing an outfit. We are creators. People want to hire you for your creations, so you need to create. And if that means... You need to get a model call to create more, to bring in more clients, to help you market and advertise, then great, do it. Okay, Eva, you have a question for me? 
Ava's in controls now. Alex went to the bathroom, so Ava Brandt is in the house. Okay. You're going to uh, ask a question, okay, Mama? Okay, your next question is, what do you do when your photos are stolen and used as another photographer's shots or their promo? Oh, I get that every day, all day. People, because I don't pay close attention to, I just don't have time. I mean, I was teaching all morning and then I did a little bit of work and then I'm here and then I'll leave for the day and I, I've missed 99% of what's on social media. So people, unfortunately, take my images all the time. I do nothing is the answer, nothing. For vendors, if I use their outfits, I tell vendors, grab my image because I probably forgot to tag you because I probably forgot where I bought it or I forgot who gave it to me. And so I always feel horrible that I'm not supporting vendors mainly because I forget and then there's no tag on the vendor and I've just forgotten. Um, good job, baby friend. And, um, but probably once a week, if not more, usually on Instagram, someone will message me and say, this person has stolen all your work and they're saying it's their work. And if I have time, I'll email that photographer and say, will you please take my work down? It's not your work. Sometimes people do it for me, which I'm so appreciative of. Um, I feel like they get caught eventually, but I don't actively pursue it. I don't think it's right. I don't agree with it, but that would be literally another job. I'd have to like hire someone to do that. So, I mean, I think that you should say something for sure it goes against copyright it's not okay and um you should try to stop it okay okay i think this one might could be the last one okay though it might take you a while though oh okay what are your future goals i think someone asked me this last time i can't answer that because then i have to give away all my future ideas um, I played the fifth. Okay, let me find I have a lot. Else. People want to know what my future goals are. I, you should ask me my goals for this weekend. <laughs> okay, there. That, that still answers the question technically. I have, there's my to-do list. It's stupid. It's just, <laughs> I give myself more work than anybody I know. I can't stop myself. I'm frustrated with myself right now because there's so much I'm trying to finish and I can't finish. And then I thought, oh, once I finish this newborn book and get it off my shoulders... I'll feel so much better and I feel worse because, because I'm trying to get everything else done. Like I took AnnaBrandt.com down last, or two days ago, three days ago. So years ago, because I used to be a web designer, I would literally delete my entire website in January. I know some of you probably are like, what the? Yeah, I have no problem doing it. I have no attachment issues. So um, I hadn't done it and my studio, my studio, my site was broken on the inside. You wouldn't know it, but it's broken on the inside. And galleries weren't showing and I couldn't reload and it was just, on the outside it looked fine, but it was broken on the inside. And so I just got frustrated and I was like, plus I'm changing my pricing and I'm like, it's all coming down. So I have two sites, AnnaBrent.com and BellyBabyLove.com. AnnaBrent.com, if you go to it, it'll say we're redesigning it. I'm doing it myself from the bottom up, myself. So I spent... Well, my driver took me to LA to get fabric yesterday. So I had an hour in the car ride there and an hour in the car ride back. And I spent most of that car ride looking at designs for my new site. And I didn't pick one. So I don't know when it's gonna get done. I'm kind of mad at myself because I wanted that done by last Monday and that did not get done. So that's an immediate goal. My certification program I wanted released last weekend that did not get released. I'm trying to finish that. I have some lessons I have to post for my conscious marketing class that's at bellybabyschool.com, the Mind Your Mindset at bellybabyschool.com, and finish my How to Sell Online at the Anna Brandt Leadership Academy.com. I need all those finished in the next week. So in the next week, I want to finish those three courses, launch my certification program, and launch my new website. But I also have to photograph like 10 babies <laughs> and like a million pregnancy because everyone's doing pregnancy shoots now and do a lot of other things. And we have a bunch of new products that I haven't even added to the shop yet, bellybabywear.com. So I have to do that tonight. So my future goals, I can't even tell you. They're so big. I can't wait. I have a lot. I have a lot of goals. So many. 
Should I answer one more? <laughs> if you want. This Does one really is COVID related. Oh, uh, ooh, that's a good way. For someone that has no clients due to COVID, do you think a way to market would be crafting headbands, also showing props you have and posting on IG? Yes. You got to make money. I would go flip burgers at McDonald's if I have to. I will never be homeless. I was telling my son that the other day. I was like, if something happened to me and I couldn't do photography and I couldn't work, don't worry. Don't worry. I will always work. And Evan's like, Mama, I'm not worried. I was like, I I will work anywhere and I will do anything. If I If this was all taken away from me, I would be like Starbucks for the morning shift, maybe the lunch shift at El Torito so I could have a margarita and a fajita and maybe the afternoon shift at Joanne's and do some crafting and the evening shift, I don't even know, at the movie theater if there were movies so I could watch a movie. I mean, I would be hustling. You gotta hustle, you gotta work, you gotta do what you gotta do. You, I love to craft headbands. I spent three hours doing it last night. That's like my favorite thing in the world to do. I'm a crafter and my kids are crafters and we're always making, there's always a glue gun on. We were hot pressing glue gunning last night. Rania came in from Big Bear with Evan and she had to hot press our aprons for the clinics. I was like, Rania, I know you just came in from Big Bear and skiing for four days, but Stephanie helped make our, our logos for the aprons and we need aprons. So she came and she was, she was using the circuit press on my dining room table. I told Ava, put on my glue gun because I got on all these new headbands and new florals. And so I made headbands for two hours. My son was doing something. I don't know what he was doing. Oh, he had to run to the studio for something. We're always crafting and doing something. Um, so yeah, go for it, do whatever. Backdrops, blankets, headbands, wraps, learn to knit. That's what I really wanna do. I would, if I get shut down again, I'm learning how to knit. That's like next on my list. That's a feature goal. That's a feature goal. I wanna learn how to knit. Oh, so I could be like, like, like at the hair salon, just knitting. Oh, I just want to do that so bad. Anyone want to teach me how to knit? But I'm super impatient. I need to go from zero to like this, like right now. Oh, look at these fell off. Yeah, I want to make this like right now. I don't want to wait. I want to make it right now. And with the pearls, and then with these pearls, now I want to go to every headband I have, and I want to be pearls all night. I could totally do this. Really, you just take wire and beads, and I could just, I could just rebead all my bonnets. <laughs> all right, one more question, then we're gonna go because it's ninety minutes later. Uh, so this one, I believe, is in reference to one of the things you just answered. I don't know if it was the COVID one or the future goals ones, but okay. why? That the, I said, why? What motivates you to do so much? Does it affect your family, personal life? Um. What was the first part? What, what motivates you to do so much? Mm, I I don't know. My mom always tells me I'm extremely highly motivated. I think what, keep in mind that my family is my family. It's our life. It's we're intertwined. And um, people think that I work like 24 or seven, but I have three very busy teenagers. Like when I get home, you would think I get home and I could just like kick back and relax or people think I go home and edit. Neither one of those things happen. I usually go home, check the laundry room, anything in there, anything I need to finish because I do have a housekeeper during the day. The dogs usually want to treat immediately. Um, and then it's child by child by child. Last night it was Ava was moving to a new laptop because she got a laptop for Christmas and she had to transfer files and that was exhausting. And... Um, what was Olivia doing? Olivia's best friend is turning 19 today, I think, or 20, and she was working on birthday gift. And Evan had just got back from Big Bear, and he's trying to buy a truck in Arkansas, and then he wants to go skiing next week in Colorado, and they wouldn't rent the Airbnb to him because he's 25. So it's literally, I'm like, bedroom to bedroom to bedroom and talking to children, and it's non it's nonstop. It's always been nonstop since they were born. When they were little, Evan wanted to paint. Olivia wanted to play with dolls. Ava was always in Play-Doh. Like, it doesn't change. I have three very, 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 very busy children. So as far as the family and the personal life, um, everybody is very busy. And we are all busy with each other. And it's all intertwined. So it's not like 
I mean, my kids are all artists. Evan building a photography studio, Ava doing her GoPro, Olivia does video editing. It's, we're constant. I was telling my hairdresser the other day, so I feel like I have mini board, con board, board meetings all the time with my little board members <laughs> because it's always like, mom, why don't we do this? Mom, why don't we do that? Mom, so it's constant. It's feeding their brains as well. I've always been highly driven. I, I was raised in a family. Alex. Well, I think the battery died. <laughs> Can they hear me? Yeah, they can Alex, man, you need to put timers on this, oh, this thing. Is the battery, cause oh, because 90 minutes? Yeah. So they can hear me, but they can't yeah, see me? So this is, then it's like, do we have to edit? Are we no. keeping this? So we, so we just take these off, then, then we don't save them? No, just do them. But then they're just, then, you know, oh, they're just... <laughs> This was 30 minutes, because the, the, the camera has a 30 minute timer. Yeah. Before it shuts off. Yeah, and, and the, battery. the battery lasts like an hour and a half. <laughs> Here so we, we are. went over both of those. So basically, there should be like a pop up on the camera. You are over your time. Okay, next one we do in two weeks, we're gonna we're gonna put a timer on it, and I'm gonna just answer. Maybe we just don't allow questions to come in. No, but see, then it ruins the fun. I just I love this. I think that we should only do the on. But then what happens when they ask all these questions? Then say next time, then we never finish them. No, no, no. I mean, I, th I think we should only do the ones that come in online. And don't let them ask questions? No, 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 no. Like the ones that are coming in live. Oh, don't do pre... Don't do pre ones, yeah. Don't do pre questions. Because then we get so many live ones that take like 30 minutes before we get to answer them. Mm -hmm. And then they might be gone by the time we get to their question. All right. So we do another Q&A in two weeks. Friday at the same time, 2 o'clock. And we won't pre ask questions. I feel like I'm missing a... We'll only answer <laughs> questions live. <laughs> All right, I'm going to end with this. People say, what makes me highly driven? I don't know. I wish I knew. I get annoyed with myself because some days I just wish that the voices in my head would shut off. I actually lounge. I do. We watched Wonder Woman last week for the second time. 1984, and I was like, I'm just gonna do nothing and watch this movie. By the end of the movie, Eve and I were like bouncing ideas back and forth. Some of them involved riding a horse and doing bow and arrow. <laughs> I just, I was raised in a highly motivating family, I guess. My mom has a master's degree in divinity and psychology and became an ordained minister, my adopted mom. And she, I've talked about her, she's still alive, I talk about her all the time. She would sew and cook and refinish furniture and make her own curtains and wallpaper and rebuild homes and decorate and raise five children, two of us adopted and speak to a church on Sunday and write sermons. And until she was like 80, people would ask her to speak. They would be like, I call her, I go, mom, you retired like five times. And she'd be like, oh, Anna, I know. But the little old ladies in the church, they just want me to speak to them. <laughs> and I would just laugh because I'm like, that's going to be me, mom. I think that I have a passion for my life and I want it to be the best that I can be. And I'm in complete control of that. And you are too. And that's what drives me. And that's what motivates me. And so not doing that is anything less than. So our Q&A went 90 minutes, 60 minutes over. Thank you for hanging out with us. I could do this for three days. Alex can't, but I can. Um, no, I'm fine with it. As, as long as you give me enough prep time before to set it up. <laughs> Alex, I feel like my whole life is prep time with you. Such a guy. He needs like notice and schedules and tasks. <laughs> Do you understand how much goes into producing these live streams? No, I have no idea, <laughs> Alex. None. No idea whatsoever. All right, so we're going to call it a day because my staff needs me, apparently. Thank you for watching. I appreciate you. I appreciate the questions. I'm doing the best that I can. I can't answer every question all the time. It may take me a little bit longer to get to that email. My clients, I work as fast as I can. Um, I'm just like you. I'm just trying to do the best that I can and just make every day a little bit better than yesterday. Thank you for watching. Bye. And for everyone that we did not get to their question, we're sorry, but hopefully next time we'll get to yours. Hopefully. And Bye. let me...
stop this. Bye, everyone.